attend this International Solar Energy Society webinar. And I'm going to hand over to the moderator who's going to give us an introduction about the webinar, the title and the speakers. And that's Jennifer McIntosh. So over to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Joanna, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Jennifer McIntosh. I'm the head of the International Solar Energy Society Secretariat. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today um, for this webinar on solar heating in Europe, challenges and opportunities. We have expert panelist speakers who will be, revi who will be providing an overview of um, these, the specific solar heating uh, field, and we have set aside time for question and answers to address questions from you, our, our audience. We have uh, just about 370 people who registered for this webinar today from around the world, so we look forward to our expert uh, speaker talks and to questions and uh, from you, our audience. So, let's see if my slide will progress. Good. So just a few words. I would like to inform you about um, the International Solar Energy Society, who we are, what we do, and what we stand for. Uh, just briefly, we are a nonprofit UN accredited membership organization, NGO. We <clears throat> have the vision to achieve 100% renewable energy for all, used efficiently and wisely. ISIS represents a diverse membership of academics, researchers, energy practitioners, consultants, students, businesses, and those supporting the 100% renewable energy transformation. We work together with like-minded organizations from around the world to advance our vision and provide information services like this webinar that highlight the technologies and other areas such as policy and other cross-cutting issues that are critical to achieving the 100% renewable energy transformation. By becoming a member, you are supporting and are part of this, this movement. Um, yeah, this webinar is available to anybody, as you, you know. However, the uh, member's benefits are that you have access to the recording and the presentations through the members area on our website. Uh, you can log in using your membership account and have access to the recordings. You can also see the presentations as well as other information that we offer our members um, in the members area. Just some housekeeping really quickly. As I said before, we welcome and encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar. To ask a question, simply type um, the question in the question pane on your screen. Please let us know who your question is directed to. This will help us to assign the questions um, as I read them aloud during the Q&A session. And we will try to get to all of your questions and uh, bear with us if, if we don't have enough time. This is a, a short session today, so uh, I hope we can, we can get to everybody. Um, I'd like to, to just give some brief information really quickly about uh, this webinar and, and, and the topic. Um, we are discussing challenges and opportunities in the solar heating sector in Europe. Our expert speakers, Professor Wolfgang Streicher from Austria and Professor Jan Olaf Dellenbach from Sweden will be <coughs> discussing solar thermal and PV coupled with heat pumps and solar district heating, two technology areas um, that are rapidly changing and are particularly relevant for the European region. In addition, we are holding this webinar in cooperation with the upcoming EuroSun 2016 conference. This is the ISIS European Regional Conference. Uh, the EuroSun is held every two years uh, since 1996 and will be taking place this October on the beautiful island of Mallorca, Spain. Victor Martinez Moll, uh, co-chair of the EuroSun 2016 Scientific Committee, will be providing some information about the conference. This event will be an excellent opportunity to learn more about this topic, as well as other uh, solar and renewable energy related fields, to uh, learn about the latest developments in Europe, as, as well as in the research and uh, academic fields, to participate in excellent discussions, to network, and to present your work. Uh, we're very pleased that so many people have joined us today to hear about this rapid rapidly changing and important field. Many of you will know or recognize Professor Streicher or Professor Dallenbeck, both longtime experts in their fields. Uh, I encourage you to look at their uh, longer biographical statements on our website. Um, globally, solar thermal technologies for heating and cooling have a 
have acquired a cumulative capacity of over five, 400 gigawatt, uh, gigawatt thermal, um, which is mostly concentrated in China in the form of solar heating system. In Europe, the market is changing as technologies such as PV become more affordable and technologies are coupled together. And much of the R&D in this field is concentrated in Europe. <clears throat> in Europe, there are already 250 large-scale solar heating or cooling systems, out of which 100 have been built in the last five years. These systems are typically applied where there are large heating and cooling loads, and we'll learn, learn more about those from Yano if here shortly. Now I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Wolfgang Schleicher. Uh, he's going to be talking about R&D for solar thermal and PV coupled heat pumps. He is he studied mechanical engineering at Graz University of Technology and has been working in the field of solar thermal systems since 1993. He now holds the chair of energy efficient buildings and renewable energy in the civil engineering fa faculty of the University of Innsbruck in, in Austria. So welcome Wolfgang and we look forward to your talk. Uh, Wolfgang, you'll have to unmute your microphone so we can hear you. Thank you very much. So, hello to everybody, and I'm very happy to speak to so many persons, because this is not, not the case in the last conferences, and I will come to that, at least in solar thermal. So, I was asked to have a speech today about uh, R&D for solar thermal, but of course also looking to other uses of solar, like PV coupled with heat pump, heat pumps coupled with solar thermal and so on, what is going on, because uh, there is, well, a changing market, changing prices, changing boundary conditions. Well, let's see if I can, okay, here is my, over the next slide, my next slide, about changing markets. Uh, that's a graph showing, uh, showing the market for solar thermal in Germany. And we see there is a decrease. There's a decrease, a, short, a, a big decrease in the market. The same is happening in Austria and other European countries. Uh, there is also a slight decrease in the market in China currently. So something is happening here. And if the solar thermal wants to stay in the market or stay good in the market, something has to happen. On the other hand, PV is still booming, and I will come to that, why it's like that. But even here in Europe, as the feed-in tariffs are going back, let's say the increase is not as big as it was in the, in the boom years in the last years here. But the rest of the world is keeping up. So how is it coming that PV is, let's say, uh, increasing optimistic market and uh, solar thermal is just a decreasing market? And it's, of course, a question of price. I have here uh, the development of prices of complete solar thermal plants in Austria, and here you see it in Europe per kilowatt hour thermal, well, per kilowatt thermal, and you see there was no real decrease in the price, not for the collectors and not for the systems in the last 10 years. On the other hand, PV. We all know what's happening with PV. This is from 2006 to 2014, the decrease of the price and the decrease is even going further down. So PV, which I am a thermal engineer, I must say, but I have to admit that PV is really becoming very interesting in the last years because of this price reduction. And that's also the driving force of most of the R&D developments we have in the last years in solar thermal and the building and renewable energies for buildings. So the goal, Jenny already told you, the goal would be 100%. 100% solar for heating, cooling, electricity demand, everything in the building. And to achieve that, of course, we have to reduce consumption of the buildings first, keeping, let's say, the energy services in the same way, the same amount of square meters condition, maybe the same mobility if we go to transportation but reduce the consumption. So we have to make all everything more intelligent, more efficient. Uh, so we want to save end use energy, but we don't want to save energy services. So just make them more intelligent. But that's not my speak today. My speak today is, a, is then about how to include the renewables 
into this reduced demand. I was talking about the competition, the competition of solar and thermal PV. And of course, they're both using the same source. They're all using the sun. And they can produce the same energy services. But PV can even produce more of it, so these services. So, and then now you could argue, well, the efficiency of PV is far smaller. We have only about 10% efficiency of a PV and about 30% of solar thermal. But on the other hand, PV is producing electricity. And if you couple that to a heat pump with a so-called seasonal performance factor of three or more, you end up with the same energy services for the same area of solar energy use. And that's how the competition came up. In the last decades, PV was just too expensive to come into that market, really. But nowadays, things have changed. So if you're looking for different uses, domestic hot water. Domestic hot water can be done, of course, with normal or conventional heating system. It could be done with solar thermal plus a backup system, because at least in middle and northern European Europe, we don't have enough sun to cover all the loads in winter. Or we have to oversize the plant by far. Or we have to use a large storage. With the PV, we can do the same thing if we go even directly. These things are on the market at the moment. Very cheap, three square meter of PV, electric heater in a small store, and that's it. Or to be more efficient, couple it to a heat pump. But the same service. And if you couple it to a heat pump, the area needed is still the same. If you go direct, we need about three times the area. If you go to space heating, it's the same thing. We can do that with solar thermal, with backup, or with PV. Again, even directly, we have some projects here in Innsbruck where we have multifamily houses, a retrofit, and social housing, but where was, where there was no centralized heating system in there. And they use the PV in direct electric heating, also for space heating. It's for me as a thermal engineer, it's not a good option, but it's a, ch it's a cheap one. And people don't like to have dirt in their apartments, so they don't allow to put in a centralized heating system. So we're also coming here into social problems to find good solutions. And if you go to cooling, well, we had uh, many IAA tasks working with solar thermal cooling, with absorption heat pumps, adsorption heat pumps. Of course, it is feasible if you have uh, high full load hours in your building, in your for your cooling application. Then the uh, the bigger effort, technical effort to produce cooling out of solar thermal, may be uh, uh, economic. But of course, with the heat pump couple to PV, you also can do, of course, domestic hot water space heating, but if you turn the cycle around, you can do cooling with the same machine. And in summer, of course, sun is shining, and if you use it for PV or solar thermal, you have to decide. Of course, then we come to storage. What's happening to excess energy you cannot use? So, in solar thermal, we have a heat storage, but normally we don't size it over as a seasonal storage not for small systems. Jan Olof will show you later that this could be an option for a large system, for district heating systems. But for small systems, we normally have one, two, maybe three day storage. And if you have even more sun shining, the energy is simply lost. What's happening to PV? Well, in PV, we can feed it into the grid. But it depends what price we get, the so-called feed-in tariff. For Austria, this is very low. It's about three cent per kilowatt hour we get currently. Uh, I think in Spain it's maybe even less. In Germany it's a bit higher. So it depends what you do with that. Additionally, in the competition is that all this electricity stuff, at least to the user, looks less complex than all these hydraulic tubes and pumps and valves that has to be controlled. So we have to work very strong now in solar thermal to make it simpler, cheaper, and so on. And if you couple the PV to the heat pump, it becomes a bit more expensive, but then it has even the same efficiency, as I told before. So these are the boundaries. 
a lot of other boundaries are known. Of course, we want to have finally 100% solar thermal, but how high should be the solar fraction we want to achieve? And of course, we can go, and here is a chart I made a long time ago, the first slide I got was made in 1996, and here you have in the x-axis you have a specific store volume, so that's cubic meter per kilowatt heat load of the building. So if you have a building with 10 kilowatt heat load, 0.3 means you have a 3 cubic meter heat store. And on the other hand, you have the specific collector area, so these lines. Again, square meter collector per heat load of the building. And of course, if you make the store larger, if you go to a higher collector area, so you get a higher solar fraction. But on the other hand, you have, if you go to higher solar fraction, you have more stagnation in sun. That means you have more time where you don't need the energy. And if you don't have a seasonal storage, you simply lose it. So per square meter of collector area, you produce less useful heat. So the kilowatt hour becomes more expensive. So if you go down here, it becomes cheaper per kilowatt hour. If you go up here, it becomes more expensive, but we come closer to our goal. Of course, a lot of technical detail has been developed for solar thermal, so the zones of heat storage is, I don't want to go into detail here, you can look that up in a lot of literature, even partly of that is free in the IAE. You have developed different modes of domestic hot water production, of how to put in the solar heat without losing temperature, and temperature losses is, let's say, so-called second law of thermodynamic losses. So every mixing we do in here means that the collector has to produce higher temperature than we can use in the store, and the collector runs with less efficiency. So all these systems in solar thermal have to be designed that we don't lose temperature, and the pumps are not running too long, so not to, not to um, have, uh, use too much electricity. But this is known. And now, of course, the big question comes up, what direction should we go? Should we increase efficiency by means of a lot of, app, a lot of technology in there, a lot of valves of boilers, of boreholes? So here we have a coupled system of heat pumps, solar thermal, valves, and so on. And everything has to be controlled in the right way, so the control system becomes quite complex and there must be someone who is able to uh, program that in the right way and to adapt it. And if a sensor is broken, you have to replace it. So should we go to very high efficiencies here, or to potentially higher efficiencies, or shall we keep it to a very simple system? And this is just a natural circulation system, as you find mostly sold all over the world, very simple. So, should we go to low-tech and cheap, or should we go to high-tech? This is a decision everybody has to take. Personally, I am, with my experience, more going to the low-tech stuff. So that means less problems in there, less failure uh, possibilities, but of course a bit less, of, uh, less efficiency, at least theoretically. Of course, if you have a system like that and you uh, don't have optimized all this control here, then maybe this system runs even worse than that. So I've, I learned as a mechanical engineer that a good solution is a simple solution. So as simple you can make it, as better it is because it's more reliable. One of these simple systems was introduced already very early in 1998 was the so-called direct solar floor system. So they didn't use a heat storage. They put the sun solar heat directly in the floor. It's a floor heating system using the concrete there, and that was nice. Very simple, a pump, no heat storage, and less control. And in our comparison that time, and other IA tasks, we found it's also very efficient. There were also old solutions. So make it compact, put everything together. That's also a big goal, because everything you put in together in the factory can be controlled. If you put it together on-site, there is a failure possibility. So I see that time is running, so I have to become quickly quicker. Uh, if you add even cooling to solar thermal, it becomes even more complex. You may need another storage, a cold storage. You need a double as big uh, 
heat a cooler to the air as with the compression system. So everything becomes even more complex. So you have to put it even more together into, into uh, one system and the black box system or you may run into trouble. What could be else done to reduce costs? Well, we did a lot of research, we still do, using maybe polymers for solar thermal collectors. As polymers may be cheaper than copper, the copper price came down again. Of course, if you go to polymers, you have to look for temperatures, so you have to avoid overheating. So you have to find ways either to have the collector cooling itself, we have here a solution cooling it on the backside itself, or you have to make it as bad, in brackets, that it never, even in stagnation, reaches higher temperatures above 100 degrees. Then it's also safe to use cheap polymers. If you go above 100 degrees, you end up not so nice. This is a swimming pool collector where you have just uh, polymers getting too hot. So the research need is integrate the solar collectors maybe in buildings so you can reduce the back cover, use the insulation of the building as the insulation of the collector, so reduce the parts to reduce the cost, maybe going to alternative materials and go to standardized kits and plug and function systems. So that's also written in the technology roadmap. That's solar thermal. Well, a very brief look on the heat pumps. Research items. Of course, also here, the costs should be reduced. So there is a mistake here, still. Reduce the costs, increase the efficiency, use different layouts like a de-superheater, what we use some companies in Austria do, so that you use the high temperature coming of the refrigerant coming out of the compressor until it comes down to the condenser temperature to produce, for example, domestic hot water. Going to new refrigerants, maybe a two-stage compression, but also other parts could be optimized. So we had a development in Austria where we had boreholes without a pump. So it's just CO2 circulating in this probe. So the CO2 is evaporating down here, going up the probes, condensing up here, and it's running down again by itself. So we have a natural circulation CO2 probes, thus sparing the brain pump for the heating for the system here and just saving electricity. Heat pump coupled to PV. That's what I said before. Would be nice to have and there are systems on the market available. Quite cheap ones. Could be a centralized system, could be also a centralized a decentralized system. Now what's what's uh, now it's depending on the feed in tariff what we're going to do with surplus electricity being produced here. So if we get a very low feed-in tariff, we have to use it mostly on-site. So either we make the PV so small that we can use electricity, or we find ways to store the electricity. Well, you all have heard about the battery packs, uh, but they are very expensive still, and nobody knows how long they last. The other way would be just to use the concrete floor. So if you just put excess energy, like in the direct solar floor heat system, so let the heat pump run and heat up the floor heating, the floor heating system more. Of course, it would be nice to know about the weather next day. If the weather will be bad, I can heat it up more. If the weather will be good, well, I don't heat it up that much to avoid overheating. So we're coming to model predictive control stuff, very scientific things that could be used here. Well, we had a, a project here just to show what's happening if you heat it up more. So if we have this curve here, so we have, that's the temperature where we shut it on and that's the temperature where we shut it off. And if we extend this temperature for heating, of course we can put more energy into the floor, but we heat up the building to higher temperatures. If we heat it up to higher temperatures, it's nice for the users, because most of the users don't want to have 20 degrees. They want to have 22 degrees anyway. But the building is hotter and we lose more energy and the pumps are running longer. So there are also some negative effects on that and we have to be careful in optimizing that. This is just to show how the temp how the energy for space heating is going up as wider we make this range. Of course there was also finally an IA task on coupling heat pumps to solar thermal, also an old idea. Uh, it's also a tricky one and it, it looks so promising in the beginning but if you go into more detail, 
you could say, well, solar collectors may be preheating the, uh, the, the water for the heat pump. This is nice as long as the sun is shining. But during night, the collector acts as a heat resistance because there is a cover here, there is an insulation in the back. So it's very difficult to gain energy just out of, out of the air. So you need to have a bat collector, a swimming pool collector that adds as an air to water heat exchanger. But then when the sun is shining, the effect is not that big. Ideas were to couple collectors to regenerate boreholes or the ground here. That looks like that you may be able to reduce the area of the ground for the ground coupled heat pump a bit. There have been also other things that just decouple things. Use the collector only for the domestic hot water and use the heat pump ground couple just for space heating. I'm doing that in my house since 20 years working very good and it's simply a decoupled system with no interaction. It's also working nice and it's a low-tech approach but you can do it also quite difficult. So also here the answers are not so simple which makes sense. Coming to the conclusions. Of course there's plenty of room still for solar thermal and PV but we have to be inventive and we have to take the chance. It's a challenge here and it's good that they start to compete because this makes here the driving force to become more innovative in solar thermal far stringent than if there would have been no PV coming down in price. But of course if you see well this may be better here and there then we should also take this. It's also the sun which we use here. But the first thing should be always reduce the end use energy demand. So reduce, uh, increase the energy efficiency of buildings, reduce the energy demand for the same energy services. Solar and PV has the similar markets, of course. PV has currently a bigger market growth than solar thermal and if the prices are still going down here and it's solar thermal not, well, I think that PV will overcome. And the rest, I think, has been set already. Of course, they should not start competing each other, but they should, in the end, compete the fossil fuels together. So we should not uh, lose our, our direction just by competing each other. The main thing is to compete oil and gas. So thank you very much, and I hope that solar energy makes you happy. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Great. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, for that excellent presentation. Um, I'm glad you concluded um, with some remarks about reducing energy use overall. I think that's one of the most important um, and oft um, neglected points of our talks, which, I, which is definitely important um, pillar in reducing our energy demand and achieving um, our renewable energy targets. So now I would like to introduce Jan Olaf Dallenbach. We'll get back to um, Wolfgang's questions uh, when we get finished with Wolfgang's talk. Uh, sorry, with Jan Olaf's uh, presentation. And I see some of you have already started sending in your questions. That's great. Please go ahead and continue to do that. Um, there's a lot of good questions already coming in. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Jan Olaf Dallenbach. He's a um, professor for building services engineering at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering in Chalmers University in Gothenburg, Sweden. His R&D focus uh, has been on reduced use of energy in buildings, uh, so it's a good lead-in from Wolf one of Wolfgang's conclusions, as well as other spaces that have demands on certain climate and activity. Uh, he has received the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Solar Award in 2005 and the ISIS Special Service Award in 2009 after serving on the ISIS Board of Directors for many years. So welcome, Jan Olaf. Thank you, Janetha. And uh, hello to everyone. Um, I will make a presentation about solar district heating that might not be um, the most uh, familiar topic in the solar world. So I will start to uh, um, present an introduction on uh, oh, my slides are not changing.
their problem with the organic content being that. That's strange. That now it's going. Now it's working. Okay. Um, so I will try to um, make a short introduction about district heating. District heating can be used when you have a dense building area, typically a town or village. Uh, you have one heating plant for the whole area and a distribution system. You use hot water circulated in the distribution system. And uh, this shows a simple principle drawing of a district heating system with a heating plant and in this case three connected buildings with substations. Hot water is circulated to the buildings and it's cooled down in the building and going back to the heating plant. Um, <clears throat> the advantages of district heating is that it's very flexible to use different and change heat sources only in one place instead of all different buildings. You can use combined heat and power. You can use heat only boilers. You can use heat from industries, waste incineration. Uh, you can use large heat pumps from sewage water, for instance. And you can also um, have solar heat into a district heating system. This is an example of a city with a district heating system, the capital of Sweden. Uh, all the green parts in the diagram from the airport Arlanda in the top, all the way down to South Stockholm is district heated with five different plants in the area. This map shows the uh, <clears throat> district heating, the cities, European cities with district heating systems. And there is about 6,000 district heating systems in Europe. And right now about 100 systems use solar heat. Um, it's more common in uh, Denmark and Sweden and some other countries with 50 to 60% of all the heat demand in the country supplied by district heat. In Germany and Austria it's about 12%, which is the same as it's in the whole of Europe. It's very common in Russia and China, and um, as you see, in the US it's called district energy. When we go to solar district heating, you need a large collector, solar collector array. It can either be connected in the heating plant or to the heat distribution system. And then you combine with the storage in order to increase the use of solar heat or the so-called solar fraction, as we call it. If we go back to the principal drawing of the district heating system, um, <clears throat> when you have a, a central solar heating plant, you connect the solar collectors to the main heating plant and operate them from there. Uh, depending on the area and the solar fraction, you need a storage. Um, if you have buildings close to the heating plant or if you build a new um, area, you can also use the buildings to have the collectors in connection to the heating plant. I will start with a small system um, <clears throat> showing a central solar heating plant. So this is a small system in Sweden where there's a heating plant with solar collectors on the roof of the heating plant and the roof of a carport. And it supplies heat to uh, about 36 residential units in multifamily buildings. And this is an example of a larger system, a new built residential area in Neckarsholm in Germany in 1997. And then we go on to the really large systems um, where the collectors are mounted on ground. This is from the city of Marstal in Denmark. Um, in the period from 96 to 2003, about 17,000 square meter was um, built. And in that case, it covered about 25% of the heat demand in the city. In 2013, another 15,000 square meter and a seasonal storage, 75,000 cubic meter water pit storage was added, and now it covers more than 50% of the heat demand in the city. 
And for you, uh, those of you who think this is a completely new technology, up on the left you see a collector array with the same type of collectors built 30 years earlier in Sweden. This is another example from Denmark, <clears throat> a large uh, system for the city of Dronninglund. The city is a couple of kilometers to the right. It is also a system storage. And um, right now, this year, um, there is a large plant under construction with 150,000 square meter, and that's 100 megawatt. So now we can talk about large scale solar heating. They go back to the initial principle schematics of a district heating system. And if we now think that this is really, really a large, large system, then it's possible to um, connect solar heating systems distributed all over in the district heating network. So if you have a suitable building, for instance, with a big roof, you can connect the solar collectors to the heat distribution system. And if you collect a lot of these systems, then you need a storage in the system somewhere in order to even out the, when you have a lot of solar heat and when you have a heat demand. This is a simple schematic of a building with district heating substation, providing heat with radiators and domestic hot water. If we put solar collectors on the roof of this building, they can be connected with a heat exchanger to the primary system of the district heating system. <clears throat> In the case when um, the um, heat power from the solar collector is less than the heat demand in the building, then the district heating will provide the rest. And if the power of the solar collectors is larger than the heat demand in the building, then the solar heat will go out into the district heating network. So this works in principle in the same way as a PV feed-in system, but we use a heat exchanger instead of an inverter. And this is one of the most um, shown examples of a distributed system in a, in a district heating network. It's a waste plant in Graz, where collectors are mounted on all the roofs and connected to the district heating system in Graz. And this map shows um, uh, the systems, the solar heating systems in Europe used either for heating or for cooling, which has more than 1,400 square meter or one, one megawatt thermal power. And um, you see that there are a number of solar cooling plants using um, absorption chillers in the south of Europe. And the majority of the large solar heating plants are connected to district heating systems. And especially in Denmark, where most of them are built. So here is a map of Denmark from two years ago, showing existing and planned solar district heating systems. And now you probably uh, ask the question, why Denmark? Well, Denmark has a situation where they have a large share of wind power, and that creates a large uh, vari variable electricity prices. And when the wind is blowing, the electricity price is low, and it's not economical to run combined heat and power. The district heating systems are very common in Denmark, and uh, the district heating system uh, with the heat storage and with different um, components in the heating plant, like uh, combined heat and power, heat pumps, storage, can actually be used to balance the price. 
So when the electricity price is high, uh, you run the CHP. When the electricity price is low, you run the heat pumps. And you have the storage to balance the demand and the supply of heat. And combined with the high tax of natural gas, solar district heating is feasible without any subsidies or support. And this might be a situation that the more countries will experience when they come a bit further with more renewables. Um, if we speak, when we speak in general about renewable energy, then we all know that we have small and large bioenergy, hydropower, wind power, PV power, CHP plants. But solar heating is completely dominated by small solar heating systems. So in order to utilize the potential of solar heat, we need to develop large solar heating systems. And that's the one of the backgrounds for the solar district heating topic. If we make a SWOT for solar district heating, the large solar, district, solar heating systems, and the strength is of course that it's renewable heat. And then um, if we compare solar heat or solar radiation, it's much more evenly distributed to everyone all over the world. It's not the same with wind, it's not the same with bioenergy, it's not the, especially not with hydro. So it's a democratic energy source. The weakness is low energy density, but that is common to all renewable energy sources. We may not think about it, but that's the case. And especially with solar systems is that they have a short utilization time. But I will come back to the low energy density issue. The opportunities <coughs> Is that you can have renewable is to keep in villages and cities. Uh, there are new business opportunities to sell and buy heat. If you use the district heating system, you can you can feed in solar heat in one place and you can sell the solar heat in another place in the district heating system, exactly in the same way as you trade electricity on the electricity grids. It's also possible to develop uh, renewable energy district cooling using solar heating. The main threats, that's the lack of incentives, interest and knowledge, and uh, really no policy. The decision makers, they don't aware, are not aware of the systems. Utilities are very conservative. Uh, and then, of course, we also have the gas networks in all over Europe, which is an infrastructure that is really difficult to get rid of. And uh, in many cases, we have a lot of waste heat, and that can also, in a way, compete with solar heat, because waste heat is more or less um, free in many cases. Coming back to the issue with this, um, low energy density. Bioenergy is the most common renewable energy in most countries and areas. If you convert um, bioenergy into heat, electricity, or fuels, you can get from 40 to one megawatt hour per hectare and year. And if you convert solar radiation into heat or electricity, you can get 2,000 to 500 megawatt hours per hectare and year. So that's a really big difference. And especially if you are on an island, you can really feel this difference. Summing up, <coughs> the opportunities with solar district heating is that it's a mature and operational technology. EU and city planners, they should of course consider this more than they do today. The district heating operators and developers should also consider solar as a driver or a complement, a driver for new district heating systems. And the solar heating uh, industry should also think about 
developing applications for district heating. And regarding Eurosun, which is primarily R&D, there is lack of policy, so we need R&D on system integration, especially. And we have rather well adopted collector rays since many years, but of course, as all technologies, they need further development. Storage is a key factor. We need R&D on both storage technologies and on the integration of storages in different systems. So uh, I hope you all come and listen <clears throat> to the latest developments in solar district heating at Eurozone. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Janola, for your excellent presentation and overview of this technology. Um, I appreciate that you presented some of the challenges um, that especially this uh, this technology is facing. And I just have one question before we get to the other, and that is, what what do you think are some of the um, barriers that uh, in in the policy area to advancing this um, uh, district heating? Technologies, especially, I think Denmark is a good example. But what is what is they what have they done differently on the policy side, um, or can what examples um, can can be learned from them on the policy side so that this um, th these type of technologies can be supported more or uh, adapted more? Well, on the policy side, they have put this tax on on uh, natural gas to uh, make it really difficult to use. Uh, natural gas and to reduce the use of natural gas. That's, I think that's the most important policy question. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so let's move on to Victor uh, martinez Mol. He is our final speaker who is going to just provide us a short uh, presentation about the upcoming Eurosun 2016 in Spain, and then we'll get to the other questions. Uh, Victor is a professor at the Polytechnic School of um, the University of the Balearic Islands and is the chair of the uh, Scientific Committee of the Eurosun 2016. He's actually joining us today from Cornell University, so thank you for being here, Victor, and uh, we look forward to hearing about your your talk and to learning about the other topics that will be addressed at Eurosun as well. Okay, uh, thank you, Jenny, for giving me the opportunity to present uh, the next Eurosun Congress. And I think if uh, people really enjoyed these excellent talks today, uh, I think they would have also a good opportunity to to continue to develop uh, it uh, uh, th these subjects in in the next Euros Eurosun. So uh, yeah, it's uh, the idea. It's uh, we will. Uh, the, the Congress will take place in, in Palma de Mallorca in a nice venue close to the sea uh, be, between the uh, October the 11th and October 14th with uh, really the technical sessions starting on Wednesday uh, the 12th and before we'll have uh, some technical tours and welcome reception. And uh, pretty much uh, the, we will have a, a, a list of 11 topics for this Congress covering a, a really wide spectrum of, of what are the really technical interests that nowadays in, in the solar thermal and also PV uh, technologies for uh, systems and, and buildings. And yeah, let's say that the focus of the Congress is to, is to uh, Center on systems as a, a little bit the approach that uh, both speakers today have presented on really conceiving the whole system and how to apply the energy, not just thinking on how we collect it, but how we use also the, the energy in an efficient way. So uh, apart uh, from, uh, we will have a, a, a nice set of keynotes also uh, presented by some of the uh, best experts in the world for its of these subjects and you can take a look at this and and also uh, take a look in in our web page is the complete list with uh, some abstracts of the keynotes 
And apart from the technical sessions and uh, the keynotes, uh, we will have uh, also some forums that I think can be really of interest for a lot of people. Uh, one of them uh, related to research policies for which uh, we count with some uh, level officials uh, of the EC. And another one in market development with uh, some industrial uh, speakers and and I think we can see really uh, nice ideas on how to uh, continue to develop the, the solar market. And uh, we will also have also parallel act acts like a brokerage event, event organized by the Enterprise Europe Network and also uh, a master course that uh, I, I have here the link if someone is interested it's free of registration the only thing it's, it's only 20 uh, positions available so uh, just uh, check if it, there is still available space there and and also uh, I hope we will have some uh, project meetings in parallel at this moment we have only one confirmed that it's uh, the shine project it's an European project but uh, that's, uh, I will take the opportunity to, to say that if you are interested in, promo uh, in organizing uh, uh, maybe a project meeting or uh, a task meeting in parallel or uh, close to the dates of uh, Eurosan, we, we, we can help in, in providing some support organizing it in Mallorca. And I don't want to take much more time from you, so just remember that uh, the call for abstracts is still open uh, by now, by the April 7th, and uh, papers will be published, uh, uh, open access in the ICES website, and uh, it's in, it has uh, its own ISBN number and indexing, it's, it's in process, so I hope that by uh, the Eurosan that will be already in place and also uh, selected papers will be sent to Elsevier Solar Energy Journal. And uh, we count with, uh, well, I have to thank uh, a lot of uh, companies that have uh, supported us, so I, both as sponsors and as uh, media partners and other kind of, of, uh, other kind of support. And nothing more, it's just uh, if you uh, need more information, please visit our web page uh, uh, www.eurosan2016.org and yeah uh, that's that's all uh, you are you will be very welcome and i hope we will meet you in in october in mallorca thank great thank you victor so um We've gotten quite a few questions now in the last uh, 50 minutes that we've been on the air. So let's go ahead and jump right into some of them. Um, let's start with you, Wolfgang, because you were our first speaker. Uh, we have a, a, a participant who would like to know um, if, um, where did it go? <laughs> on the systematic level, what would be the impact of massive electrification of the heating sector, uh, for example, grid improvement costs, peak CO2 outcome, and uh, what would you see it as a positive outcome? Wolfgang, can you do a microphone? There, okay, <laughs> I hope you can, you can hear me now. Sorry, I was writing answers. <laughs> well, this is a very, uh, not, not so tricky question. I mean, it strongly depends how you produce your electricity. Uh, and as we want to go away, and all European Union wants to go away from fossil fuels with 2050, then we also produce electricity out of renewable energies. And there is, of course, uh, many possibilities, hydropower, in Austria, we have 60%. In Norway, they have 100% of electricity produced by hydropower, nearly 100. We have wind power, we have PV, we have uh, solar, thermal, high temperature systems. We could have, you, we could use biomass, but biomass will be used for other things probably. Uh, so there are many possibilities. And uh, of course, there are impacts in the environment, but we have to think about what is more important. Is it more the global impact of global warming or is it the local impact of a hydropower station, of course affecting rivers, fishery, whatever, but things could be overcome. Uh, but when the electricity is produced out of renewables, then of course we need more grids, 
this is something uh, uh, which people don't like to accept it, uh, uh, the most people that are living then close to these wires. But I think we have to do it simply because we have to put the energy around and we cannot produce everywhere the electricity we need. And we also need more storages and the best electricity store we have in the moment is hydro pumping power stations. For long term they have 80% efficiency from electricity to electricity. Again, there is local impact. But if you compare it to power to gas and then back gas to power, then you end up maybe with 30% and not at 80%. If you use batteries, just imagine how many batteries you need if you compare it to a big pond up in the mountains. And you know, uh, well, batteries may be cheaper, may be a local solution, but also not the long term because we have here high losses over, over time. So uh, to my opinion, if we have a renewable energy producing enough electricity, the impact is positive. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, I'll move on to the next question. Can you describe systems where solar and PV also use, are also used for domestic electrical load in all seasons? Um, or is it better to feed into the grid? It depends on your feed-in tariff. I mean, it is uh, in the question of macro ecology, it is, it is not a real question. As long as we feed into the grid and there will be less electricity produced by fossil fuels. It doesn't matter if we use it ourselves or not. If you look on our own pocket or on our own money, it depends on the feed-in tariff. And if the feed-in tariff is lower than we have to pay for the electricity, then of course we like to use as much electricity ourselves. And the simplest thing is to use for domestic hot water, for heating, for cooling, is couple it to a heat pump, a reversible heat pump that is capable of doing all that. And if you go to humid areas, if you go to uh, well, Indonesia or whatever these countries where it's hot and humid all over the year, you need dehumidification and also this can be done with a heat pump system. So you can do it everywhere. <laughs> okay, good. Um, let's move on to a question for Jan Olaf. Um, we have a participant who would like to know how um, they have fixed the energy unit costs for solar district heating while radiation is a varying source. And do these systems integrate with existing district heating systems or with other technologies? Can Olaf? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, well, of course, the solar heating systems integrate and interact with existing district heating systems. Uh, if you have a rather small collector area, then you have a buffer storage. And um, if you have a larger collector area, then you need a seasonal storage. But it's all, uh, I mean, the majority of all district heat, solar district heating systems are built in connection to existing district heating systems. Uh, we have a person, a participant in Portugal who is writing that there's no potential uh, market in Portugal and, and what do you think of this in, in terms of district heating for Portugal and other countries? That, well, that have very few. I mean the, the main prerequisite to have district heating is that you have a dense area with heat demand and there's a huge district heating system in Madrid and I guess they should be possibility to have a district heating system in Lisbon. Okay. But the gas is too cheap, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that's always a challenge. Um, yeah. Gas is cheap and uh, it'll be a challenge to update systems like this, but there are certainly um, policy measures that can, can, can best promote solar district heating as well. What are some of the things that planners have to consider when they can, uh, when they're trying to implement something like this? Obviously space is a is an issue. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean of course you, you have to consider where you can uh, put all these pipes um, between the buildings. Um, that's an infrastructure that you need to have in the ground in the same way as you you have a uh, gas pipe in the ground. So, but yeah, there's a lot of issues. If you are not used to have district heating, then there's a long 
uh, way before you actually can use district heating in our country. And we have this uh, solar district heating um, EC project where we try to help all the countries to find a way. And uh, we are especially working with the uh, region of Ronald in uh, France, Tübringen in Germany, and uh, Styria in Austria. So if you look into one of my uh, links on the last uh, slide, uh, then there's a lot of information about how to implement district heating and solar district heating. Okay, and uh, just a note, everybody will have those uh, PDFs of those presentations up on our website shortly. Um, another question for Wolfgang um, about, there was one on policy, uh, what is, um, Sorry, let me see if I can find it. Um, does Do you think that solar thermal costs are trailing PV because of the lack of attention by policymakers? And what sort of policies do you think would help reduce costs and increase market share? Well, that's, an, again, an old question. I think uh, the cost can be reduced, firstly, uh, by the plumbers. Why can I say that? Because in, in solar thermal, as in all uh, gas heating area or heat HVAC area, the price difference between the production cost and the final consumer costs is about 50 to 60 percent. So the rest of the money is somewhere at the plumbers, installers, and so on. If you go to PV, it's only 20 percent in between. So there is something, well, where you lose a lot of money. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can also reduce, could reduce the costs by reducing materials. So using material of the building as part of the collector, as the insulation, uh, and so on. Uh, currently, it's a bit helping that the copper price is down again. So we, we have, again, cheap, a cheaper material available. But I think from the policy, at least as I know from, from Germany and Austria, I don't know in all the other countries, uh, there are the same subsidies for these systems. And it's uh, also the subsidies for PV were going down in Germany and Austria, which also leads to a shrinking market of PV. But this is nothing we want to have. We want an increasing market for both. So still, well, we need subsidies. And as uh, the electricity price, for example, for fossil fuels went down dramatically in the last years, and we are on the spot market down to two cents per kilowatt hours for electricity. Uh, yeah, we, we have a, a big problem here. Uh, so, of course, policy could do something, but we cannot subsidize forever. Uh, we should have make an equal subsidizing, but if you do subsidies, you have to think about uh, if I have a specific amount of subsidy money, how much if I'm a good policy maker, uh, how much CO2 do I spare with what subsidies? And then I can think about where I put my subsidies. Uh, so I think it's both it's policy, but it's of course also the HVAC industry that has to react itself, if they want to. Okay. Um, so we're actually over time, um, but I do have one or two more questions, uh, unless any of the panelists have to leave. No problem. Okay, so there's a question here um, for Jan Olive about the issues with pit storage. Let me see if I can find it. Um, what are some of the experiences from pit seasonal storage uh, regarding leakage of water and heat losses? Jan Olive, can you say a few words about that? Yeah, um, I mean, this, uh, <clears throat> the storages uh, that are built in Denmark uh, now, there is a, lo a long row of um, storages built. And the first uh, storages built, they had these problems with um, leakage and uh, things like that. But uh, they're right now building a storage with 200,000 cubic meters. So I think that um, the problems are solved. Okay. Okay. Um, and then one final question. There's a, about, a question about the UK Renewable Heat Initiative. Um, has it been successful? Um, first, do you know it? Has it been successful? And, and can it be emulated elsewhere? 
is is that the, was that the question for me John Olof? yes I think it's for you um, unless Wolfgang you can also add about to the UK that. yes the UK the only thing I know is that they they, they are building district heating in UK much more now than before but I okay. don't know how that is connected to the subsidies. The subsidies okay. on both uh, solar heating and, and solar PV in UK has been dropped dramatically the last years. Okay, Wolfgang, do you know anything about the UK? So, no, no sorry. Situation? Sorry, I don't know anything about the situation in the UK. I'm sorry. Okay. Good. Well, we are over time by minutes, and we're still getting a few um, a few more questions in. We will um, hold on to these and see if we can get a few of them answered after the after the webinar. Um, otherwise, I think we've been able to address many of the topics already here. Some have been repeated. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. I want to thank uh, our excellent speakers for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us today. Um, also to to our audience for joining us and for your excellent speakers. I would like to remind everyone that we have a short survey which will be launched when you leave the webinar and we welcome you to complete that so we can get your feedback on this. I've seen, um, I hope you've learned a lot from, from today's talks and, and been motivated to submit your abstracts and join us for the Eurosun. I've seen many familiar names in our list of attendees today from past Eurosuns and Solar World Congresses, so I look forward to seeing you all again and to hopefully welcome you to a future ISIS webinar, which will be held again, well, they're held on a monthly basis, so we'll have another one for you here in a few weeks. Um, that's all the time we have for. We will have a, this recording of the webinar up on our website in a few hours, and uh, we also encourage you to check the, the members area for websites and join.isis.org. So thank you, Joanna, and thank you, Victor, uh, Wolfgang, and Jan Olaf. And if there's nothing else to add, then I think we'll go ahead and close today and um, see you again next time.